Hi, I'm Amy Cooster. Um, it, during the day, my day job, I am the Youth and Family Program Coordinator at the Skokie Public Library just north of Chicago. And by night, I do all sorts of other library things, including most recently co-authoring the white paper adopted by the Board of the Association for Library Service to Children titled Media Mentorship in Libraries Serving Youth. And I'm going to give you a bit of a, an introduction to media mentorship and children's librarianship today. So let's get started. What is a media mentor? That is a great question, Internet. So a media mentor, the most simple definition is first a person who supports children and families in their decisions and their practice surrounding media use. Now, let's deconstruct that a little bit. So it's our job as media mentors to support kids and families. Sound familiar? It's something we've been doing since there were children's librarians, since there were libraries serving children and families. What's different now, or really what's an evolution of this service we've already been providing historically, is that we're applying this sort of support to the realm of new media, digital media, smartphones, apps, tablets. Um, so we started off with books, we expanded to include audiobooks, audiovisual materials, and now apps and technology are the newest frontier where we want to support kids and families, and we want to support them in making the best media use decisions for them. And in order to do that, as media mentors, we're also going to be people who have access to and share some research and recommendations with regard to children's media use. If we want children and families to make the best decisions for them, we need to first help them ha feel equipped with the best recommendations and information possible. The same way that we're not just necessarily going to set a kid loose in the library to find the best book for them, we're going to give some feedback to the parent, give them a little bit of guidance, use our knowledge and expertise, consult some sources. And the same thing goes with media mentorship when we're talking about using things like apps and ebooks and digital games. So really, what I want to emphasize at the get-go is that media mentorship really is just an evolution of a service we've been traditionally offering to families. So when it comes to talking about resources and recommendations, there are probably a good five that I would recommend you check out. Um, first and foremost, and probably the recommendation resource people are most familiar with, is the American Academy of Pediatrics. So as of the time I'm filming this video, the most recent media use statement they've had with regard to children and adolescents is from 2013. Um, it was updated from a 2011 statement, and the kind of the important facts to know about this statement is that they're saying um, children who are ages three or older should use media for screen media for one hour or less per day, and children who are ages two and under should use screen media for zero hours a day or not at all. Um, I think it's important in considering this statement from the AAP that a number of doctors, pediatricians who are members of the AAP responded to this 2013 statement with concerns about the definition the AAP is using for screen time in creating these recommendations, namely that digital media, what we see today, is very, very different in terms of interactivity and potential um, interactive uses than traditional screen media of yesterday. So it's comparing basically a tablet and an app, interactive app to a TV screen. And so these pediatricians while not necessarily 100% uh, disagreeing with the AAP statement in 2013, did recommend that the AAP consider what they're using as criteria for screen time in future recommendations. So hopefully, I would guess we'll see something to that effect sometime in the next year or two. That's what I would cross my fingers for. Another great resource to know and have access to and share with families comes from the Fred Rogers Center and the National Association for the Education of Young Children. These two groups paired together to issue a joint statement recommending the potential positive uses of new media, digital media, for children through birth through age eight. So this is a great resource to look at, and it specifically talks about using 
digital media intentionally. So I think a lot of times statements think of the worst case scenario, which would be a, a caregiver or a teacher or someone in a child's life using a screen as a babysitter. And what the Fred Rogers and Nacy statement really says is that there are um, possible productive uses as long as they're being used intentionally, the technology is being used intentionally, and it is also being used with a purpose for education, uh, hopefully, most effectively when it's tied to um, learning outside of the screen experience. So resource number three that I would recommend you familiarize yourself with comes from the Joan Gans Cooney Center at the Sesame Workshop. And Joan Gans Cooney Center, um, their biggest contribution, and they've had a lot of contributions in this realm of uh, digital media and children, but one of their biggest has been emphasizing what is called joint media engagement. So this kind of echoes what we heard from the Fred Rogers Nacy statement in that we want this technology to be used intentionally, but more specifically, used jointly with an older child, a caregiver, so that the caregiver who is using the device with the child can provide some amount of guidance. So I like to liken this to giving a kid who can't read yet an alphabet book and not really mediating the experience with them, not using it jointly. If you give a kid who can't read an alphabet book, they're going to look at the pictures, but they probably won't learn anything. Whereas if you have that alphabet book with a caregiver or older child to mediate the experience, to have conversations, ask questions, um, prompt tracing the letters, any of those sorts of interactive behaviors, the educational experience and value of that uh, reading an alphabet book is going to be much, much higher. And the same goes for when we're considering digital and new media. When it's used jointly, it has much higher potential for positive and educational uses. Resource number four would be the book Screen Time by Lisa Guernsey. And she, um, before the, invent, uh, the invention of the iPad, she had already released a book that's been revised and renamed Screen Time. <clears throat> and her book was focusing on how all sorts of media, including things like those baby Einstein videos and other media over time, how that affects young children. And so if you're looking to kind of delve a little bit deeper into a lot of the brain research about different types of media up to and including digital media, I highly recommend Screen Time by Lisa Guernsey. The last resource in the kind of core five that I would recommend in terms of having um, formal recommendations and research behind digital media and children is from zero to three. So this organization is absolutely fantastic and they focus definitely on the younger spectrum of kids. Um, but they have some great resources and really some great talking points to share with parents. So I would definitely recommend checking out Zero to Three. They're online and they have a great number of resources there. So if you have a little bit of that background knowledge about um, what experts in fields of child development, child education are saying in terms of what's appropriate, what maybe is less appropriate, um, maybe you're then ready to look into children's digital media on your own and think, oh my goodness, this app store is completely overwhelming. Um, how do I even go about finding what is a good app and a productive app to use maybe in my story time or to recommend to a family in the library? Great question. Um, the resource I would most recommend if you're going to um, look at different apps, I would recommend looking at some of your traditional evaluative resources. So places like School Library Journal, The Horn Book, they already have um, a lot of app reviews in a lot of instances, including, you know, Kirkus. Basically, if you think of your common um, review resources, check and see what their app reviews say. If you're looking to evaluate things on your own, however, I highly recommend a rubric that was developed by a children's librarian in Homer, Alaska. Her name is Claudia Haynes, and she was one of the co-authors on the white paper, uh, Media Mentorship in Library Serving Youth. And she's developed this outstanding rubric that has a set of questions for the technical and interactive aspects of both book apps and game apps. So things that you might be using with kids from birth through, you know, junior high, high school, some great things to consider when you're using apps to test them to see if they would be useful or productive to include in your programs or services or even to recommend. So last but not least, 
I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about some ways that libraries across the country, big, small, rural, suburban, urban, um, libraries of all sorts are already acting as media mentors. So I'm going to get my cheat sheet here. Um, so one way that libraries are already serving as media mentors for the families and their communities is by adding digital media into their story times. So I mentioned ebook apps and uh, story apps, and you can really read stories, you know, on an iPad or project to a TV screen or a, a wall projector. You can do those things in your story time. They're great for um, large format books so that you want everyone to be able to see the pictures in a large group. Um, and it really is just another way of incorporating a story into your story time. It can be as simple as that. Another way that folks are incorporating media mentorship into their existing programs and services is by tailoring some of that playtime that they have available after their programs and adding in some tablets that have been curated, preloaded with some select high quality apps and letting kids and families play with them. So having some app play alongside your block play and your kitchen play. Uh, making that a possibility. And going hand in hand, a uh, growing number of libraries are offering app advisory, so reader's advisory for apps. Um, and in a program setting, this can be as much as saying, hey, I used this app from this developer. Um, they have a lot of high quality things, so if you're looking for a good story app, um, this would be a place to look. Um, but also, I've seen libraries, including uh, folks at the Madison Public Library, Carissa Christner up there, um, offering entire app advisory programs based around different uh, topics and themes, the same way um, one might theme a program around a uh, story time around farms, you can theme an app advisory program around farms, or whatever topics are of most interest to the kids that you serve. So a third example of media mentorship is to provide caregivers in your programs and in your library with some succinct messages about using new media with their children. So I want to emphasize that these messages should be informational and not non-judgmental, the same way that we use early literacy messages in story time. So we want to give a quick fact or a snippet with a, an action that families can use at home with their children to encourage the most uh, productive behavior possible. Um, fourth, and this is in particular starting to look at using technology with older kids, so I want to emphasize that even though a number of the resources and recommendations available focus on young children, that doesn't mean that the only uh, children we're talking about with media mentorship are young. So when you start to get to elementary age kids, junior high, even high school, a great thing to do is to focus on digital media as a tool or a particular skill to focus on and learn in a program. And once you've utilized um, or gained some of those skills for that tool, um, you can utilize that tool, utilize those skills to create something, making it an even more meaningful programming experience. Another example of media mentorship, and in a lot of cases it's a little more informal for folks who come in and use the library um, without attending programs, would be providing mounted or circulating devices in the library. So I know a number of libraries, including um, my current library and my former library, where we had mounted on the ends of uh, shelves or on tables, a couple of iPads, again preloaded with apps deliberately selected by one of the youth department staff to promote perhaps early literacy skill development or uh, science skills and knowledge, but providing those or having them uh, in a circulating bag with a list of great apps and um, great recommendations for how to use those technology most effectively. Again, um, really emphasizing this idea of joint media engagement so that parents and caregivers are using technology with their kids in intentional ways and instilling positive behaviors in that way. A sixth example of media mentorship happening in libraries today is the offering of curated lists. Um, so a number of libraries, a growing number, are putting together app lists in the same way that we've traditionally done book lists or reading lists. 
So this can be a great way to highlight um, not only some really high quality apps, but to annotate those um, lists a little bit and say, you know, this app is really fantastic because it is open-ended or it doesn't have very many bells and whistles and distractions. So not only providing some go-to good apps that you would recommend the same way you would recommend some high quality books, but also starting to give parents and older children the tools to identify high quality apps on their own. Last but not least, one of the types of media mentorship I'm currently really excited about is libraries in which staff are training teens to serve as media mentors among younger children who may see them using their own devices and want to model that or want to replicate that same behavior. So using them to model positive um, media usage and also using them to have conversations with um perhaps some older people who are using the library and may not feel as comfortable with technology and have a lot of questions. So inserting teens who a lot of times are called digital natives, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they know inherently how to use these technology positively, um, training them to be able to first use it positively and then share that training through modeling and just talking with uh, other folks in the library. So those are seven different ways I'm seeing libraries across the country currently engaging in media mentorship. Um, I want to close off this video by emphasizing once more that media mentorship is just an evolution of something we've already done for years and years and years in library, and we do it really well. We are very good at supporting children and families mostly because we care about them so much that we're willing to put in the time and the effort to do the research, to have the conversations, to be as supportive as possible. And I would encourage you to think of right now digital media, but really in the future, any sort of media that comes in and continue to think of yourself as that support system, that reference, that uh, mentor, so that we can continue to serve children and their families the best ways possible, regardless of what the future brings. Uh, thanks for sitting with me for a little while. I talked a bit about media mentorship. If you want more information, more resources, I recommend you um, Google ELSC and media mentorship because they have all sorts of resources, um, including further examples of how libraries are currently doing media mentorship. Um, there's a webinar and there is also a direct link to the white paper. Thanks guys. Have a great day.